an Aussie Christian, you might come across Aussie Christian culture. Now, part of Aussie Christian culture is we just tell it like it is, slap you in the face, very seldom have grace and mercy, and um, probably leave you with footprints all over your face. That's how Aussies tend to be, in your face. We do that in the church as well. Now, if you talk to a Chinese Christian, you might come across Chinese Christian culture, where in Chinese culture, it's very important to save face and not be embarrassed in front of the crowd. And even if you have to tell a little white lie, just so that we don't embarrass you or we don't want to hurt you. Now, if you talk to a Canadian Christian, you may come across Canadian Christian culture. Always polite, never offend anybody. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. It doesn't matter, your life's falling apart. I'm good. The only bus in the world that says, sorry, not in service. <laughs> if you come across an African Christian, you may come across African Christian culture, where in some African countries, the means justifies the end. And so you do whatever it takes for the gospel, even if it's maybe slightly illegal, you do whatever it takes. I wonder if you've ever noticed that there's a huge difference between cultural Christianity and actual biblical Christianity, what we would call kingdom Christianity. You see, sometimes we're so familiar with our own upbringing in our own culture, go to church all your life, we've been doing religion and going to church all our life for those of us, we end up doing religious things that are very familiar but may not be biblical. I've done this all my life. This is how, this is how we do church. I'm not talking theology, I'm talking about culture now where the culture of your nation has an impact on how you express your Christianity, whether it's biblical or not. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. And so what I want to suggest to you is that if you have a church community that were to consist of many nations and we're worshipping together, a lot like we are now, and Lord willing, more in the future, where there are many different Christians from many different nations all coming together to worship God and to live in community. I want to suggest to you that that may actually be healthy for us. Now, it's very messy because, as you know, in the Anglican mission in Canada, of what, what we belong to, we have two bishops, a Chinese bishop and an Aussie bishop. And when Bishop Silas and I get together, it's fun. And over the years, we've had to navigate and negotiate Chinese Christian culture and Aussie Christian culture. And out of that distills, if we're listening carefully to God, kingdom culture. So you've seen that too when Pastor Peter Wu here in South Surrey has a church. When his congregation and our congregation gets together, that's a Taiwanese Mandarin speaking church and we're a you know, largely English speaking church. When we get together, sometimes it's really awkward. And because we're committed to each other, we nut through those issues, we work through those issues and we discover that some of the things that you do in your Chinese culture you may have done it in your church, it's not necessarily biblical. And some things that we do in our Western culture, we may do in all our church, but it may not be biblical. It's just what we're familiar with. So um, when these Christian national cultures clash with each other, and we can push through the differences, and this is not what we've always done, but what does the Bible teach us how we should live? We push through national Christian culture to kingdom culture. And actually, you're going to, I'll explain this. I believe that the text we read this morning 
is all about moving from culture of a Christian nature to culture of a kingdom nature. So I've entitled my sermon today, From Culture to Kingdom. And I believe that Jesus is going to teach us some principles that will help us make sense of the world. You have all heard a million sermons on the woman at the well. I wonder if you've ever considered that this is a question not about an adulterous woman coming to faith, but a lesson in learning about the kingdom of God. Let's explore it. We're in verse 1 of chapter 4. And we're going to do a bit of exploration today, so I'm going to be asking you questions. So we're going to study this together. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was baptising more disciples than John. Look at this verse 2. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptised, but his disciples were doing the baptism. That's why we know that Jesus didn't actually baptise anybody. So he left Judea, um, back to Galilee, and uh, had to go through Samaria. So here's a quick map. I have a bunch of slides I want to show you. And as soon as we get our projector going and we can find somebody who can help run the projector, click the slides, we need a little bit of help with that. If you're interested, let me know. I've got some fantastic um, slides to show you during sermons so that if you're a visual spatial person, you can see stuff too. But here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Dead Sea. Jesus is baptising here. John is baptising here, Jordan River. Judea, Samaria, Galilee. And Jesus decides to go from here to here via this route. And so we begin the story as we always do in the Gospel of John in context. Jesus learns about his, the Pharisees' concern. No doubt Jesus is and will continue to become a threat to the Pharisees. So he leaves Judea and goes back to Galilee. It's it's quite a journey. By the way, the crow flies probably 30 kilometres at least. And uh, we're reminded that John is is, um, at Anon near Salem. Jesus on the other side of the Jordan, baptising. Here's the first question. Why, from reading the text, why did Jesus decide to go back to Galilee? Your turn. What, what, what do you think the motive is from the text, what you read in the text? Why did Jesus decide to go to Galilee? The Pharisees heard about him. So why would he then decide to go to the backwaters of Galilee? They didn't want to kill him at this time, but they were going to kill him. And because Jesus knew the story, why? and Guy, remember when we were studying Luke, you always used to tell me this, that for Jesus, he went somewhere because of what? Because of timing. He knew that it wasn't time to get crucified just yet. He's at the beginning of his ministry. If he hangs around in Jerusalem and does the things that he does, they're going to crucify him within the next month. So he goes up to Galilee, which is like in the boonies. In Australian speak, it would be beyond the black stump. That's where he's going. So that he's got three years to teach his disciples. He, he knows exactly what he wants to do and the timing of all this. He needs to do this in three years. If he hangs around the big city, they're going to have him arrested and executed in no time. His cousin John was, not, was executed not just long after this. So Jesus goes from the countryside of Judea to the back hills of Galilee. But first he decides, the text t- tells us, um, now he had to go through Samaria. You don't have to go through Samaria. You can take the shortcut along the bottom route, the highway that goes, there's a big highway in those days, a Roman highway, underneath the Sea of Galilee, get get, get straight up to Galilee that way. 
So here's a question. Why do you think the text tells us that Jesus had to go to Samaria? Because he had to meet with the Samaritan woman at the well. He had to meet with the Samaritan woman at the well. God told him to go that way. He was pastoring. He was pastoring. He was plowing the yeah. field of undiscovered uh, kingdom of God. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and he knew that there was a lady he was going to meet. It was all planned. He, he, he knew this. So look, he, just in this, in this general context, here's the first note that if you're writing notes, number one, Jesus always knows exactly what to do because he's God. Exactly. Jesus always knows exactly what to do because he's God. Oh my goodness. I ended up at the Samaritan well and I met a woman there. Wow, what a surprise. No, it was a plan. It's always a plan with Jesus. So, we go from the general context, verses 5 and 6 now, we go to the specific context. He comes to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Not only is Jacob's well there, but his son Joseph's tomb is there. Who has been to Joseph's tomb? I have been on Google Google Street View. That's where I travel. That's my I I can't get out of the country at the moment, but Google Street View, I can travel everywhere. Who's been to Jacob's Well? There's a big church there now. I've got photos I wanted to show you from 1920 before the church was built. It's a hole in the ground with rocks and steps. It goes down about 75 feet in the well. Before, before, before the tourists got there. Anyway, um, this well was there since about the 18th century BC. And they've been drawing water from it. And what time of the day was it? Okay, noon or... Okay, whose Bible says it was noon? Hands up. Whose Bible says it was the sixth hour? Okay. So, Ed and I were talking about this. Here's a real issue for me. The Bible translators in the NIV interpreted the text. The Greek text says it was the sixth hour. The Bible translators interpreted the sixth hour as noon. Now, you tell me, why do we all say it was noon? Come on, you've heard this sermon a thousand times about the woman at the well. Why it was it noon? Because you taught us that. Sorry? Because you taught us that. I never taught you that. No. Someone, someone taught you, but it wasn't me. Patricia. Midnight. Any other? You come on. You've heard the story a million times, Jenny. You must be married to a preacher. So, you may not talk to me after this sermon because I may throw all your glasses and upset all your glasses, but, you know, my commitment to you is to tell you the text as I believe it and teach it, and I've done my research on this. I've got bullets to fire if if I need to on this one, right? But here's an issue of cultural Christianity. 
We read the story about Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus at night. Our culture automatically assumes, well, Nicodemus is, is a scaredy cat and he's quite afraid and he doesn't want to be seen by anyone, so he goes to Jesus at night. It could be that nighttime was a good time to go see Jesus because he was so busy during the day that if you want to have an extended conversation with Jesus, you go one evening. And if you were Nicodemus, one of the senior politicians, he doesn't care who he's seen with. Jews and Pharisees and scribes are trying to kill Jesus all the time, were trying to trap him all the time, would not be unfamiliar for leaders of the Jewish um, Sanhedrin to be seen hanging around with Jesus. But we interpreted that Jesus met, or Nicodemus met with Jesus at night because he was afraid. We interpreted that. The text doesn't say that. Ophelia. So, so let, me, let me explain to you the text. This is, this is where I'm going. So the text in the NIV says it was noon. The Greek text says it was a sixth hour. Now Jenny's, got, Jenny's, Jenny's right on this. When you look at the synoptic gospels, which means the parallel gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, they all have parallel accounts. In John... John is not a synoptic gospel because John has accounts that is not in any of these others, like the woman at the well. The note, you notice too, if you go to the end of the reading, in verse 25, the woman says, I know that the Messiah, and then in the text we read in brackets, called Christ, is coming. All the time in John, we read things in brackets. I know the Messiah, brackets, Christ. Why? Let's start with this. Why does John always include brackets? Jewish audience. He's clarified the text because he's not speaking to a Jewish audience. He's clarifying the text because he's not speaking to a Jewish audience. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are speaking largely to people who understand the Jewish context and they use a, a Jewish clock. The timing. John uses the Roman timing clock. And so, when we talk about Jewish time, the sixth hour, that would be midday. But if you take Roman time, the sixth hour is 6 p.m. Now, if you go through all the passages in John... And all the passages in the synoptics that mention time, anybody done that? Oh, I have. You'll find that there is a contradiction between Mark and John when Jesus was crucified. Unless you understand that John is using Roman time, then it matches. All of that to say... Maybe I'm going to upset your apple cart on this one. But I believe the text says that the woman at the well came in the evening, at six o'clock in the evening. Jesus had just walked at least 30 kilometres with his disciples. You're not going to get there by lunchtime. They went into town to buy food. You don't buy food in town at lunchtime. You buy that in the eve for the evening. And there's a lots, lots more. But what I'm going to say to you is, I understand and interpret the text to say that they arrived at the end of the day. Well, what about this adulterous woman? It's a Samaritan context. We're not talking about Jews now. We're talking about Samaritans. They live a totally different lifestyle. They hate the Jews. In fact, the Jews and the Samaritans go way back a thousand years back to Solomon's son. The king that took over from Solomon was Jeroboam, uh, Rehoboam. 
But Jeroboam, he wanted to have his own kingdom. So he took the ten tribes of the north and made the nation of Israel. He actually set up two temples and he put golden calves in them so that the faithful Jews didn't have to go to Jerusalem to set up and worship God. They could go to Bethel and worship the golden calf. Jeroboam did that. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he kept Judah and Benjamin and had the, the nation of Judah. Way back, those people in the north became the Samaritans because that was the area of Samaria and the capital town of Samaria is what they became known as the Samaritans. If you go today to this very site, and you can go there on Google Street View, you can see Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And on Mount Gerizim, every year, the Samaritans still meet. There's about a thousand of them left. And on the day when the Torah was given, they celebrate and they have the, I think it's called the uh, Codex Nablus, one of the original texts on a scroll that they hold up. <coughs> but the Samaritans to this day hate the Jews. And for a Jew to travel to Samaria, are you kidding me? In fact, the highway that went from Judea to Galilee went on the other side of the Jordan with Samaria here. Other side of the Jordan come up and cross back over because Jews never went to Samaria. So it's the sixth hour. It's 6 p.m. Now, I'm happy to debate that with you and you can go and do your research. But if you want to know, um, those of you who are scholars, Ed, it's John 19, 14, when Jesus is crucified. If you don't use Roman time, there's a contradiction with Mark at the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus, unless you use Roman time, and, and then you can harmonise that. Anyway, the first point that I wanted to make was that Jesus always knows exactly what to do. He's God. Number two, I want to say to you in the context of this specific part of the context, Jesus was tired from the journey because he's a man. You get that? He's God and he's a man. And he's hungry. And he's hungry and tired and thirsty. Halt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know the principle of halt, right? That applies to my life, definitely. So we come to verse 7, and we're not setting this up now for... Uh, adulterous woman who comes to meet Jesus. No, we're setting this up for a cultural exchange. A Samaritan with a Jew. A Samaritan kingdom of God with the heavenly kingdom of God. A Samaritan religion with the kingdom of God itself. An Aussie religion with the kingdom of God. A Chinese religion with the kingdom of God. A Canadian religion with the kingdom of God. African religion with the kingdom of God. You get it? That's what this story is about as far as I'm concerned. So, he gets to the well and a Samaritan woman turns up in the evening. No big deal about that. And he says to her, would you give me a drink? The disciples are going into town to get the evening meal. And so a conversation, hang on a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? And he says, if you knew the gift of God, uh, I'd, I'd be giving you living water. Peter? Yes, sir. May I ask a question? Please, of course. Uh, I know the Jews still exist, but the Samaritans, do they still exist? Yes, there's a thousand of them as of 2022. And they meet on Mount Gerizim every year for their big procession. So they still hate one another? It seems like everybody in the Middle East hates everybody else. <laughs> with, with, our, with, with all respect to our Egyptian friends, I, I do believe that tensions in the Middle East are pretty strong. You were going to say, Ed? Yes, yes. And also, there's more Samaritan men than women. So they haven't gotten up 
women's journey said they've been importing Ukrainians right. recently and trying to turn the Samaritans. Gosh. And, and they also have a high priest. The Samaritans have a, have a high priest. Anyway, um, so we get to the story. Jesus goes up to this woman and he asks her for a drink. Your turn. Why would Jesus ask this woman for a drink? He's thirsty? He wants to interact with her. The whole reason he went from where he was baptising with his disciples, instead of going up there to Galilee, he went this way to Galilee, was to meet with the woman. Now, you're at a well, Jew, obvious he's a Jew, obvious she's a Samaritan, look and dress. Um, How are you going to start a conversation? Would you like to know about the kingdom of God? Yeah, that's going to go down like a lead balloon. The most obvious question you would ask at a well is, would you give me a drink? That's why he's asking it. And she says, something's not right here. You're breaking cultural norms. The culture doesn't allow us to talk. You're breaking religious norms. Your religion and my religion, she's a religious woman, doesn't allow us to talk. You're asking a Samaritan for a drink. Jews and Samaritans don't get on. Haven't you been reading our history for the last thousand years? We hate each other's guts. Don't you remember King Jeroboam in the north and King Rehoboam in the south and the temples at Bethel and the golden calves? Jesus has an agenda on my, in mind and he asks her, could I have a drink? And Jesus now begins to start paying attention to the distinction between cultural religion and the kingdom of God. He does this with Jews too, but for today we're looking at another nationality, Samaritans. If you knew what I was talking about, you'd be asking for living water. Your turn. Why does he take the conversation from, can I have a drink, to living water? You'd be asking about living water. Why does he ask that question now? He's introducing himself. He's introducing himself? He wants to get, talk about faith. Yeah. And um, Janice? It's getting her to think. It's getting her to think. Outside the norm. Outside the norm. He's moving the question from the physical water to spiritual water. He's moving the conversation from cultural religion to kingdom of God religion. Can you see that? Say amen if you're still with me. Amen. Okay, good. We'll keep, we'll keep going. So... Here's the first of three tests that Jesus will test you with, test me with, test the woman at the well with, in terms of cultural religion and kingdom of God Christianity. Here's the first test. Number three, Jesus will test your religion. He will test your religion. I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Mm -mm, We don't talk. So I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that there are no Anglicans in heaven. (laughs) There are no Catholics in heaven. There are no Baptists in heaven. There are no Pentecostals in heaven. No Charismatics. No Charismatics. There are only Christians in heaven. That's the good news. Anglican, Baptist, Catholic is the adjective. Christian is the noun. We all wear a little badge down here, whether you wear it out aloud or not. A little badge, as one old guy told me. We're Catholic for that. Catholic, yeah, exactly. If you die at the end of your life, when you die, and you go down, it's going to burn off. (laughs) If you die, when you die, and you go up, it's going to fall off. In the end, the tag doesn't matter. 
And that's what Jesus is trying to get through to this Samaritan woman. You're a Samaritan, I'm a Jew. In the end, we're not talking about cultural religion. He will test your religion. He will test your religion. And by religion, I mean your faith and your expression of how you do it. So now we get to verse 11, and the woman responds. He started this conversation about living water. We're going now from the physical to the spiritual. Sir, she says, you're going to give me this living water. You don't even have anything to draw from out of the well. This is 75 feet deep down here. So she's still thinking in the physical, right? He's got to keep moving this conversation to the spiritual. So are you, are you greater than Jacob? Like, who do you think you are? And she, he says, verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty, but if you drink the water that I have, You'll never be thirsty again. She's still trying to think in the physical. What would I have to drink never to be thirsty again? And so, if I don't have to come out to this well every day and get water for the family, like, tell me, please, where do you get this living water from? Ah, you can see the conversation's moving now. She has no idea what Jesus is talking about, but she just knows that there could be a chance she doesn't have to walk all the way out to the well every day. That could really help a lot in the family dynamics. Your turn. Why does Jesus ask the question about Never having to be thirsty again. Why does he ask that question to this lady? You'll never have to be thirsty again. It's a parable that makes her think. Anybody else? Why would he ask that question? I think we all have longing in us. We all have longing. Yes, yes. There's a hunger in us, a thirst in us. Whoa, I want some of that water. <laughs> you got living water? Never be thirsty again? I want some. I won't have to come to the well again. So it's sort of like putting salt in the oats if you want Yes. Make them yeah, you know that old saying, you, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can put salt in the oats. So do you really want this living water? So here's a second test. The first test, Jesus was testing her religion. Number four, Jesus will test your motives. He will test your motives. Why are you doing this religious stuff? Your <laughs> cultural religion. He will test that. Now we come to the third test. Now he starts getting personal and deep. At this point, there'll be many people just turn around, get lost. Verse 16, Jesus says, now that we've started talking about water that you can get that will never make you thirsty again, and we're moving the conversation from the temporal into the spiritual, Jesus says, Okay, well, go back and get your husband. <laughs> she says, I have no husband. How innocent. That's a bit like you and me when Jesus points out our sin. No, actually, I don't have any sin. Well, no, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and the guy you're living with at the moment isn't your husband. <laughs> You tell me, your turn now. Why would Jesus take, move the conversation, ask a question now? Go get your husband. Why would he ask that question? Why would he tell her to do that? Patricia? So that she would, so that she would realise that he knows, he just knows her. 
right? He, that would, she would, eventually she would know that he knows her. What else, what other reasons would you be asking? Go get your wife. To test her honesty. Right. Um, salvation, but then also too. Secondly, though, uh, salvation is covenantal. There's a covenant. You shall be saved in your household. Yeah. And so if you're if you're going to enter into this relationship, your whole household is coming in because there's a covenant that you start right, right. with the head of the home, especially in this culture. We got to deal with the covenant. It, it has implications yes. for the rest of the family. Yeah, you were going to say. All along, is Jesus offering the Samaritan woman salvation? We're coming to that, but. You don't just go up to a Samaritan woman and say, do you want to get saved? No. Right? We've got to go through all the cultural religion because there are people out there and Christians too in all our churches, in all our nations. If we're not careful, we're doing cultural religion and not kingdom religion. And that's going to take a conversation. <laughs> We've got to get from the water in the well to living water. So he is offering a salvation. But it's a process because... She's a religious woman. Now, you've been told she's an adulterer and all that. Yeah, okay, maybe. There's nothing to say that all her five husbands never died. Just that the guy that she's living with now is not a husband. We call that common law. But he is coming to the conversation. And he is testing her. Go get your husband. Look, I'm out of here. What, what's this? What right do you have to ask me? Who, how dare you? I'm back to the village. No. She answers the question and she doesn't lie. <laughs> Actually, I'm not married. I don't have a husband. Well, that's sort of half the truth. <laughs> and then Jesus tells her everything about her. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with isn't your husband. Jesus will test your religion. Jesus will test your motives. And number five, Jesus will test your honesty. Cultural religion, you can get away with stuff. Kingdom of God, you don't get away with it. Those things that I said, kingdom of God, Aussie Christians learn how to be gentle and gracious. And Chinese kingdom of God Christians learn how to answer honestly, even if it offends somebody. And Canadian Christians, who are kingdom of God Christians, will tell the truth where they're at, no matter what. And African Christians, who are kingdom of God Christians, will follow the rules and the law even if nobody gets saved. Jesus will test your honesty. And then finally we come to verses 19 to 26 where we move the conversation from well water to living water, from culture to kingdom. Whoa, I can see you're a prophet. You know everything about me. Oh, yeah. And then some. Now she goes back into religious mode. This is cultural religion. Well, our ancestors worshipped at this mountain because the well of Jacob is just at the foot, a bunch of stairs, and just at the foot of Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans meet today. Over here is Mount Ebal. And if you drive down this road and then turn right, you get to Joseph's <coughs> graveyard, jo Joseph's mausoleum. You worship in Jerusalem and we worship on this mountain. And she's going back to religion again, her cultural religion. Jesus is trying to explain to her, I'm not interested in cultural religion. I want to tell you about the kingdom of God. Believe you me, lady, there's a time coming when we're not going to be worshipping up here on Mount Gerizim or down there in Jerusalem. 
God revealed himself through the Jewish nation. There's a time coming when the people who worship God, and here's the, here's the transition. We're going from Samaritan, from, from Samaritan Jewish, Aussie, Canadian, African, Chinese to kingdom. We're moving from here. There's a time coming when we're going to worship God in Spirit and in truth. Did you hear that, church? Say it out aloud. Spirit and truth. Okay, so we're moving now from culture to kingdom. Jesus is saying that this worship is not a geographic thing. It's got nothing to do with with the nation that you were born in and how you express your Christianity. When you're part of the kingdom of God, we go way beyond our national cultural Christianity. We're talking about spirit and, in, and truth. And then she says, back to her religion. Religion has very, very powerful ties on us. I've done it all my life like this, and I'm not going to change. I had a situation this week. I was counselling a pastor, and um, there's a situation where the senior pastor is retiring, and the assistant pastor wants to become the senior pastor. The church wants her to become the senior pastor. And she says, I can't do that because I was brought up that women aren't pastors. So one of the elders said, well, I'll become the leader of the church and she can work under me. (laughs) Only a pastor's wife would know that, Janice, right? You can see the issues there, right? Now we're navigating... Okay, how about we move from culture to kingdom and maybe the lady who was brought up all her life thinking that women can't be pastors, maybe she has to go back to the scripture and maybe think about being a kingdom person. You can still have a senior pastor over you if you've got a problem with women in ordination. But the, the problem was, and I'm not one way or the other, doesn't matter. The problem was, we've got an issue. This is, this is the way I've always done it. So we're going to find an answer, get an elder to be the boss of the church. And that's going to be even worse. We do this all the time in our churches because we're so familiar with the way I've been brought up. But are you willing to go to the scripture and, and, and work it out and even change the way you think about things? Because if you're not willing to change the way you think, you may get stuck in your cultural religion. What, does it mean we don't, can't learn anything? I change my mind constantly over the years as I learn more and more and more of the scripture. She says, I know that the Messiah, John is lovely, puts it in brackets now, the Christ, so that those of us who don't have it, Hebrew background, Jewish background, and understand what he's talking about, the Christ, I know that he, when he comes, he's going to explain everything. That's cultural religion. And he says, guess what, lady? I'm the Messiah. So much for all the critics who say that Jesus never confessed to being the Messiah. <laughs> right here, <laughs> I'm he. Jesus isn't interested in cultural religion. He's interested in kingdom religion, in spirit and in truth. Now, I'll close with this. When Jesus uses these words in the Greek, spirit and truth, these are absolute terms. This is not a relative term. Now, this is hard for us in Canadian culture when we talk about truth. But the Greek word aletheia refers to absolute truth. There's only one truth in the kingdom of God and there's only one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is God. Now, you may not agree with that. You may not even like that. You may not even think that's politically correct, which is cultural religion. But Jesus is saying, if you want to understand the kingdom of God, you need to understand that there is an absolute truth And there is only one legitimate Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of God has to do with the Holy Spirit and absolute truth. 
So when you hear Christians, especially in the West, especially in countries like Canada, where we say, well, you can have your truth and I can have my truth. And, and I, I knew a bishop once, an Anglican, actually Ed and I knew a bishop once, an Anglican bishop who said that many religions lead to God. That's not what the text says. The text says there's only one truth and there's only one spirit. And it's not true. You've heard me say this. All roads lead to Rome. That's rubbish. You go to the end of Beecher Street, you get to the beach. You don't go to Rome. (laughs) There's one spirit and one truth. If you want to understand the kingdom of God, you're going to have to move from cultural religion to kingdom religion. Now, this one truth, one spirit, very exclusive. But even Samaritans can adopt it. That's the amazing thing about one spirit and one truth. There's only one spirit and one truth, but it's available to every human being. Even Samaritans, for goodness sake, Jews leading Samaritans to kingdom religion. That's just amazing. And so Jesus is moving this lady from cultural, in her case, Samaritan religion to really, really understanding kingdom Christianity. This is not Jewish. This is kingdom. This goes way beyond Jewish stuff. And so point number six there, Jesus is the bridge from culture to kingdom. Jesus is the bridge from culture to kingdom. And if you learn one thing from today, maybe you might reconsider how you describe yourself as a Christian. Maybe when people ask you, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm an Anglican, maybe you might describe yourself in the terms of kingdom of God, I am a Christian who happens to go to an Anglican church or a Baptist church. Joel, you want to say something? I guess the first thing you could ask is, well, are you working to make Jesus your Lord? Yes, that's it. That's it. Because if you are a kingdom Christian, obedience to Jesus is a very central issue. If you're a cultural Christian, obedience to the norms of your church, to the rules, to your traditions, to your theology, becomes very important. But even the word Catholic, it means universal. Yeah. If, you, if you go to the Middle East five years ago and you were captured by the ISIS troops, you um, would not be asked if you were captured by an ISIS soldier, are you a Baptist or an Anglican or a Catholic? They're going to say, will you recite the Quran or will you lose your head? See, the ISIS troops have understood the kingdom of God better than we do. (laughs) If you call yourself a Christian, and by Joel's definition, he is the Lord of your life, then then you're getting the idea of kingdom. So, summarise, Jesus knows exactly what to do because he's God, but Jesus is tired from the journey because he is a human being, he's a man. And Jesus will test your religion. He will test your motives and he will test your honesty. And he will get you to consider religious Christianity, national religious Christianity, to kingdom of God Christianity. And eventually you'll discover that he's the bridge from your cultural Christianity to your kingdom Christianity. So next time you're at the well... In the evening, and somebody asks you for a drink of water, you should have the conversation with them.